Welcome to the Kiwi Mana Bay. Hey, and welcome to the Kiwi Mana Buzz. This is Gary here, and this is episode 52 of our Big Hibbing Podcast. And we are a Big Hibbing Podcast that broadcasts from the hills of the Waitaki Ranges in West Auckland, New Zealand. And our podcast is about beekeeping, gardening, and political issues. And with the election in New Zealand coming along in September, which is next month, we uh, need to all be aware of which which political party will help the bees the best. So think about that before you uh, cast your vote next month. And this week we have a special guest, Dr. Han Tenekist, who is an esteemed toxicologist and author. And he's been involved in cancer research for most of his career. And he's recently done, done some studies on the impact of neonicotinoids in relationship to the bee decline issue in, in the world. And he, he discovered these chemicals are not only affecting bees, but other insects and birds as well in the Netherlands. In 2010, he published his findings in the book, A Disaster in the Making. So welcome, Hank. Thanks a lot for coming. It's, it's a great pleasure to, to have an opportunity to talk to New Zealand beekeepers. So I very much appreciate uh, your, your efforts. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. And I'd like to send you my book as well. Um, if you can provide an, an address, then I will send um, a book to you. Oh, I've actually already I've already bought it. Oh, you've already bought yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I um, bought it a couple of weeks ago, so I've, 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 I'm halfway through it. Okay. Yeah, it's very good. So, who did all the paintings? Was that you or someone else? Well, the story is like this. Um, uh, after I decided to publish the data, I went to a good friend of mine um, who's a painter and I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to publish a book on a very sad story. In, in fact, it's a disaster story. Yeah. So if, if any, anybody uh, will, uh, will read the book, it's got to be a, a very nice and beautiful book. And um, so I told him about the contents of the book and that I'd been studying uh, bird decline in various Dutch habitats. And I asked him whether he had any corresponding paintings that could serve as an illustration, making it an art book and a science book at the, in one book. Oh, yeah, and that's he, good. And fortunately he had, so... So we decided to select paintings to illustrate for as an illustration for the book. Yeah. And, and we had a very competent art designer at a printing company uh, here in my town. So it all came together and, and, and I think it's uh, the book is very, very pretty. It's, uh, and it's, uh, it's a coffee table book with a terrible story. That's, that's <laughs> what, what, what it boils down to. Yeah, it's a bit of a nightmare, isn't it? It, it is because, um, well, I'm a toxicologist and I've, I've worked in, in cancer research for, for most of my career. And, um, I, uh, I worked at the German Cancer Research Center in Heidelberg in the 1980s. And I was coached and mentored by a very famous oncologist, Herman Drukray, who, um, who done groundbreaking work on the dose response characteristics yeah. of chemical carcinogens. And um, so I know, knew all about Drukray's uh, studies uh, that were published in the 1960s. And um, long after we, we, we had uh, these discussions, uh, in 2009, when I was working as a consultant toxicologist, I by accident discovered a new generation of of insecticide, the so-called neonicotinoids, displayed exactly the same dose response characteristics in arthropods, uh, including bees, of course. And I nearly fell off my chair. You know, I, I thought, well, hell, what's going on here? Then subsequently, I discovered that these uh, insecticides were polluting the environment. They're water soluble and they they can easily leach from soil. So um, I thought, well, if that happens, 
then the um, the, uh, the 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 these chemicals will move distribute through the environment and uh, threaten a lot of non-target uh, insects. Yeah. So um, and then I thought, well, if if that happens, if if this, these chemicals are washed out of the soil into waterways and groundwater, and they're also quite persistent in soil and water, then these compounds will be diffusing through the environment and killing or debilitating insects and probably arthropods, and by doing so, progressively reducing invertebrate prey for higher organisms. So I, 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 my, my suspicion was that these chemicals were going to cause a break in the food chain. Yeah. And, um, and that's, that's what worried me stiff. Uh, and that, that was uh, uh, why I decided to, uh, to raise the alarm. Yeah. And to, to publish the book. And that, that's what inspired you to write the book then? That's right. So uh, now there are not many data on insects. Uh, We've got data on bees because we need them, and on butterflies because they're pretty. Yeah. But apart from that, uh, we've we've got very uh, few data on insects. I mean, there are there are data on moths in Great Britain, which are also in steep decline. But on the whole, if you take the insect uh, as, as a category of species, we know very little about. The, the insects. So I decided to look to start looking for birds, where we've got um, uh, a lot of uh, reliable data, and I would select species, the bird species, that were in decline, and then I investigated their nutrition, and I discovered that without exception, the the the, but the birds that were in steep decline were dependent upon insects. Yeah. And particularly in uh, when they were reproducing, they were raising their chicks with insects because obviously insects are a source of protein, which you need for, for growth. And then, so I indirectly, I, I thought I got every, I had evidence for, um, for a break in the food chain. Yeah. And, and uh, then I decided to uh, to to make it public. Yeah, and no, that's it, fantastic. And, and so, because they they they, don't, they take a long time to break down in the environment, don't they? Near nicotinoids. That's, that's right, a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, in yeah. fact, the half life of clothianidine in some soils is up to nineteen years. Okay. So after two decades, you've still got half of your your compound in the soil. Yeah. So, we, in fact, we, 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 we call these chemicals neonicotinoids because they act like nicotine. But in fact, their molecular structure always contains a chlorine atom. So if you like, they're really organochlorines and they, uh, they are as persistent as organochlorines. So we, we, we have basically recreated Rachel Garson, Sign and Spring. With a new generation of insecticides. Um, now DDT, for example, was was lipophilic and slowly metabolized, and was concentrating through the food chain and affecting birds of prey um, at, at the top of the food chain. So, so birds like ospreys, pelicans, falcons, and eagles. Yeah, uh, but. Uh, neonicotinoids uh, are, are water soluble, will permeate a whole plant, and um, and they leach from soil, threatening non-target invertebrates in general. And that means that they will cause a, 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 a break in the food chain, and then all the organisms above that link are then in threat of extinction. And if you look at the, uh, the, 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 the number of species that, that depend on, uh, on, on insects, for example, the cotton plant is insect pollinator. Wool and leather come from the most part 
from sheep and cattle that have eaten insect pollinated legumes in the diet. Yeah. And, silk, and silk, of course, is a natural fiber produced by an insect, the silkworm. Uh, the, the approximately 40 or 90 percent of the diet of freshwater fish consists of insects. And among the amphibians, frog, frogs, toads, and salamanders uh, depend on insects. About 75 percent of the diet of the common toad is made up of insects. Among yeah. the reptiles, insects are the food of choice for lizards, chameleons, green glass snakes, and and horned toads, uh, and about one third of the diet of game birds and songbirds are insects and their relatives. I guess fish as well. Yeah, fish, fresh water fish. Yeah. And um, most orders of, of mammals contain insect eating species as well. Uh, to name a few opossums, guscuses, bandicoots, Marsupial moles, hedgehogs, moles, uh, uh, bats, most bats, anteaters, uh, armadillos, pangolins, some mice, and, and raccoons, they all consume insects on a regular basis. Yeah. And even among the primates, our, our closest relatives, uh, insect eating is, is the norm. Uh, both gorillas and chimpanzees fashion sticks into tools to help them extract termites and ants from their nests. Wow, yes, I mean... So, so, so the, the, the implications of, of, of the extinction of invertebrates or insects are tremendous. And on top of that, um, neonicotinoids are weakening the insect's immune system, and this is allowing infections to spread through hives. One thing common to bee colonies that go on to collapse is a greater variety and higher load of parasites and pathogens than other colonies. Um, yeah, so, so they're actually making the hives susceptible to more disease, aren't they? That's right. Yeah. And um, comparing the results of with museum records of bumblebees showed that the relative abundance of, of four species had declined historically by up to 96 percent and those species that had declined had uh, significantly higher infection levels with the pathogen nosema bombi yeah so exposure to neonicotinoid insecticides is likely to have occurred and may have weakened immune systems such as they that they became more susceptible to pathogens the massive decline of, of amphibian populations uh, are, are linked to infections. Uh, the citrus fifth citrate fungus is devastating frog populations. Two species of one common, common frogs that had inhabited the, the thousands of lakes and ponds in California, Sierra Nevada, are being wiped out by chytridiomycosis. So it's, it's a fungus that is devastating the, the frog populations. Yeah. And frogs are obviously depend on, on insects. And again, here they may have been exposed via their diet to small doses of neonicotinoid insecticides. And that may have weakened the, the amphibian immune system, such as they became more, more susceptible to pathogens. Um, okay. The massive decline of, of bat populations is linked to infections. Um, uh, that they call it the white nose syndrome in the United States. It was first found in a cave in New York State in the 2005-2006 winter, and then rapidly spread through the northeastern states. Um, it's a, they, they've got a powdery white, white nose tip. And, um, this, uh, this was, uh, caused by a fungus, uh, Geomyces destructans. And this infected the skin and wing membranes of bats and, and was uh, associated with unprecedented numbers of death. And there have been declines 
of birds in the US due to pathogens. Um, conjunctivitism caused by mycoplasm um, um, caused the death of many wild house finches in, in, uh, in Washington DC in February 1994. Oh, wow. And in the first three years, uh, he was called, identified the, the pathogen as mycoplasm galliceptigum. That's a p pathogen of poultry that had not previously been associated with wild songbirds. And in the first three years, it killed an estimated 225 million finches. And there was a dramatic spread of the of disease to house finches in the Midwest and the Southeast. Meanwhile, it's reached California. So, and then they, in Europe, there have been um, infections of of bird species such as the green finch, which was um, devastated by by Trichomonas gallinae, a protozoal organism, which invades the bird's crop and mucosal lining of the beak. Yeah. And uh, chaffinches were affected by by a virus, the papilloma virus, and and ki killing chaffinches. So there are, there are um, a lot of indications. Blackbirds, for example, were, were devastated by a, a virus from a tropical virus from Africa, Yuzuta virus, and it killed nearly 300,000 blackbirds in, in Germany in 2011. So there are all kinds of incidents in our wildlife that in, in invertebrate dependent species that point to immune suppression that may have been caused by, by neonicotinoid insecticides. So it is really a disaster in the making. Yeah, not absolutely. Only, not only are these chemicals exceptionally toxic to insects, yeah, but they, they also threaten, um, threaten uh, the food chain and um, may break the food chain and, and cause devastating effects in wildlife. Well, that's the thing. I don't think people really understand the complete how how one you know one destroying one species can affect everything, can't it? That, that's that's right. And um, what has happened is that um, because these those response characteristics of neonics are very similar to those of of, of chemical carcinogens, we, what we've underestimated is the risk of chronic exposure. Uh, so. Um, Usually in, in environmental toxicology, we assess risks on the basis of acute tests, short-term tests, and we very rarely conduct chronic toxicity tests. Now, had we done so, with, for example, with, with honeybees, we would have seen that we require much less of the, of, of the insecticide to kill bees in the long run. Yeah. Uh, so, um, the infinitesimal amounts that we find in pollen and nectar are sufficient to kill bees within their lifetime. But we haven't detected that because we've only done acute toxicity tests. And these acute toxicity tests are too short to, to, uh, to demonstrate the long-term toxicity of, of, uh, of these insecticides. And that's the, the, so basically toxicology as a science has to go back to square one and and um, and revise its risk assessment procedures. Yeah, that's indeed. what I've been um, uh, uh, demanding for for many years now. That our entire risk assessment system needs to be revised. We need to assess the the environmental risks of pesticides in chronic toxicity tests. And that so far are not being conducted. No, I mean the the testing they did to approve these pesticides in America was quite lax, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Now uh, the, the sad thing about the United States is that the EPA scientists uh, already arrived at similar conclusions before I wrote my book, but apparently they uh, they don't have a final say in the uh, registration procedures. Uh, I mean, 
the risk analysis was correct, the risk assessment, but the risk management was certainly not decided by scientists. And that's one of the problems I think we're facing, that it is a, a risk benef benefit analysis that eventually um, was in industry's favor so far. Although in Europe there are now partial bans on, on neonicotinoids in crops where, where for example, the, the exposure of, of bees to in neonicotinoids is, 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 is likely. Yeah, and, and is it true the um, they're actually doing a total ban of neonicotinoids in the Netherlands? Well, um, I, I've obviously been um, uh, active on the political level as well, and I've got very good connections with several political parties in in in, in Holland, and and the the the, the, the parliament uh, carried a motion calling for a national ban on the neonics. But so far, the, co the government has declined to imp implement the motion. Oh, okay. Uh, obviously, what well, you will see, Holland is a, is a big exporter of agricultural products. And what they're afraid of is that they will suffer uh, an economical disadvantage if they on, uh, unilaterally ban the neonicotinoids. Because obviously, th th these compounds are fantastic insecticides. And they, what they fear is that they, they will not um, uh, produce the the, the, the the similar amounts as yeah. they used to in the past with 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 the with the aid of neonicotinoids. So it's basically an economic issue for the present the present government. And they don't think I I, I think they don't regard the, the environmental problems that seriously. Uh, as long as there aren't sufficient bees, they argue, we don't really have a problem. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but that's a bit short-sighted, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And do you, do you disagree that um, if they reckon, or Bayer have said that if you apply them as per the instructions, they're totally safe? Well, Bayer, Bayer always maintains that the compound has, been, has gone, or the compounds have gone, to a regular product development process, which is true, and that they have been reviewed by the authorities and declared safe, and uh, and then that these compounds were subsequently registered. So what they argue is, well, what can be wrong? We've, we've done everything that needs to be done in the product product development process. Uh, and now you come and say there's something wrong with the compounds. We don't buy that. Um, so they're, they're basically ignoring the evidence that that, uh, that um, we've generated that the chronic toxicity has been underestimated. Yeah. And that is a definite danger for invertebrates. Here. So, um, I mean, I can understand their, their point of view. they obviously in the, in the market too. To make profits and uh, and to be successful in business, it's basically the failure of our regulators to recognise that we we really have a problem on our hands here. Yeah, and absolutely. That action is absolutely needed to uh, to uh, reduce the, the problem because even with a ban, you see, the problem is far from solved because these compounds are nearly as persistent in the environment as DDT. So even if we ban these insecticides now, they'll still be in the environment for a couple of decades, and they will remove, they will kill insects yeah. in all the time. So um, I think that there's basically a total underestimation of of the road to disaster that we're currently on. Absolutely. That's why I called my book "Disaster in the Making." Yeah, absolutely, and that's at disasterinthemaking dot com. Is that right? That's right. Uh, you can buy it via the internet, either a hard copy or a PDF. It's a PDF uh, is about ten dollars, and uh, the the website is www.disasterinthemaking.com. dot com. Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great book. I've uh, almost finished it. A lot of lot of uh, good research in there, Hank. So it's a fantastic book. Well, it's it's. Um, 
I think uh, I think it's a beautifully illustrated book with a, with a very sad story. And I've researched the birds, although I'm not an ornithologist. I've researched the the the, the bird data uh, very accurately. And if you take the evidence together, then then it, it, there's, there's no doubt that there, that we have a break break in the food chain happening before our eyes. Yeah, absolutely. But that's the important message that needs to be put across. We're breaking the food chain, and at the end of the day, we're going to be suffering too. And your your country, New Zealand, is one of the most beautiful countries in the world. When 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 New Zealand was discovered, the European botanists didn't recognize ninety percent of the species. Yeah, we, you you have a natural heritage that needs to be preserved um, by all means. So I I think. And the New Zealand government would be very wise to apply the precautionary principle and ban these compounds for the sake of New Zealand's natural heritage. I, I can't agree with you more, Hank, but unfortunately they haven't gone down that road, <laughs> unfortunately. No, but so have most other governments as well. Mm, absolutely. So, so the damage that's done to the insects is irreversible, isn't it? It is irreversible, Um Basically, my mentor, Hermann Druckheim, was able to explain the, the dose-response characteristics uh, of chemical carcinogens by, by, by assuming that um, chemical carcinogens um, cause irreversible receptor binding and that this, the effects of this irreversible receptor binding are irreversible as well. And if you make those two assumptions, you will um, get uh, a dose-response relationship where the effects of, uh, of a chemical are reinforced by time. Um, in fact, they're uh, determined by the double integral of, uh, of concentration over time. Yes, yeah, so that's so, a cumulative uh, effect on the... So yeah. that if you take a chemical carcinogen, that uh, damages DNA causing mutations and the effects of these mutations are, are irreversible as well. So um, as far as the genotoxic carcinogens, the DNA damaging carcinogens are concerned, Duke Ray and his uh, colleague Kupfmuller were proven right. Now Bayer denied that um, neonicotinoids have uh, irreversible interactions with the nervous system, uh, but it is it is a, a fact that uh, infinitesimal amounts are sufficient to cause to cause uh, lethality in the long run. I mean that they can't deny. Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, they're obviously trying to keep their compounds on the market, you know, and I. I understand that. Well, it's a billion-dollar industry, isn't it? So, you know, they, they'd be keen to uh, keep it on the market, wouldn't they? Yeah. Oh, what, 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 what I do think is that, um, that uh, you know, they, 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 they should... Common sense dictates that um, if you know that your chemical is causing... is likely to cause havoc in the insect world, then you should be concerned about your image as a as a chemical company and withdraw these compounds. I mean, that would be a, the, the wise long-term strategy because I think the chemicals are going. It, it's only a matter of time. Yeah. And uh, if, if, if you keep resisting uh, withdrawal, then what will happen is that you will end up with, with, with uh, a loss of, uh, of image, you know, your your reputation will will be will be um, very poor in in, in 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 society if you've resisted um, what uh, independent science uh, has now convincingly demonstrated. Yeah, to, yeah, in, indeed. I mean, uh, you know, Bay Bay could do everything they can to improve the reputation, couldn't they? Well. I think I think for them, 
a very wise strategy would be to say, okay, we, we will reassess the, the toxicology of the neonicotinoids according to the, the, the dose response characteristics that, that have now been uh, demonstrated and take the, the more dangerous compounds, compounds that are likely to cause uh, lethal effects within the lifetimes of honeybees. Um, we'll, we'll withdraw them from the market, but we will defend those compounds that uh, are, are relatively safe for insects. I think that would be a very wise decision. Uh, and if they would also invest some money in, in independent environmental toxicology to get risk procedures um, up to date, I think they, they would do a lot to, to improve their image. And, but I think the, the, main, the main factor here is, is failing regulatory authorities. Um, um, they, they've got to take the lead and say, we, we, we're going to apply the, the, the precautionary principle on some, on some neonics because they're simply too dangerous for the environment. Yeah, absolutely. Sort of, sort of ban them until they've proven they're safe, basically. Almost until they're pro- proven safe, which I think is very unlikely. But uh, yeah, that would be a wise decision. No, I think that's a great but decision. That, 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 that's what's needed. We need a, a few courageous uh, regulators that are uh, will go the extra mile and convince their their politicians that this is the way to go. And in Europe, some some have done that, and the European Commission has already instigated a, a temporary ban on three neonics. So that's that's a good first step. But obviously, Bayer and Syngenta, Syngenta, the producer of thiomethoxam, are, are contesting that decision and have gone to court to uh, to get it reversed. Yes, yeah, we've heard about so that. It's still, it's still a battle, and uh, there's a, a hell of a lot of lobbyism going on in Brussels and Washington to keep these compounds on the market. Yes. So uh, we're, 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 there is light at the end of the tunnel, but we're not through the tunnel as yet. No, exactly, and I think the battle is only, only starting in New Zealand, so wish us luck. Yes, um, uh, I've been in touch with... Pat Basket and Karen Valines. Pat Basket is a retired uh, journalist, and they've already um, tried their level best to to uh, bring something about in New Zealand. And Sue Ketchley has been very supportive. You know, Sue Ketchley of uh, of the Green Party of New Zealand. Yes, yes, she's very uh, good. And uh, all I can uh, say is that. If you're concerned about bees and insects in general, uh, support Sue Gadsley because she's she's doing great work in New Zealand at the moment. She she is, but unfortunately she's retired from Parliament recently. So that's that's right. But yeah. she's an asset to uh, to the Green Movement. Yes, yes, she's she's a very uh, very passionate lady. Yes, and highly intelligent and. Uh, uh, she she uh, she's she's also read my book, which I very much uh, which I was very pleased about. Oh, okay. Well, I'll make sure she gets a copy of this uh, recording. Okay, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah. Give her my uh, please extend my best wishes to her. Yes, yes, we will. And to Pat and, and Karen. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll find them. No, that's fantastic. And um, do do near nickel swords actually? I know they affect the nervous system of insects, but do, do have they had any effect on human beings? Well, that's what I'm very concerned about because they act like nicotine, and uh, nicotine is an environment, is a neurotransmitter, as we call it in um, in, uh, in in toxicology. Um, basically, the uh, the ex- smoking during pregnancy is associated with uh, hyperactivity disorder uh, and autism uh, because the, the, when a mother is smoke, a pregnant mother is smoking, she's exposing the fetus to nicotine and the fetus is, is, is uh, developing its brain at that moment in time. 
Yeah. Uh, and um, and so basically, there there are adverse effects of nicotine uh, on the developing human brain, and that results in autism and uh, and ADHD as and also in learning difficulties and um, behavioral problems. Um, so, and now we know that uh, neonicotinoids like imidacloprid or acetamiprid uh, operate in exactly the same manner as nic nicotine. They also bind to these receptors in the central nervous system of humans. So I, I'm very concerned about about the impacts of of uh, exposure to neonicotinoids in in fruit and vegetables. Yeah, uh, and also if you live uh, near nearby uh, an agricultural plot, then uh, there's obviously also a possibility of getting exposed to these chemicals. And I think it could have, and then if you realize that um, the, how, how the, what the dose response characteristics are like in bees, uh, if the same mechanisms operate in humans, then we can expect severe problems in 20, 30 years' time. Yeah. And, and we, uh, in fact, there has been an, an exponential rise of autism in, in California since the introduction of the neonicotinoids insecticides. Well, I so think, I think the, that's... The uh, correlations yeah. are, are deeply disturbing. Absolutely. I, th I think that autism is quite more prevalent nowadays than it ever has been. So I it, think it's, that's a well... Uh, it's, I yeah. think it's one in, one in 10 or, or one in 20. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but... I, I think one in twenty is probably the correct figure. Yeah, but that's that's a terrible prevalence. You know, that's that's far too hard to hide. Absolutely. And it, 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 there, there's been an exponential rise since the 1990s when these neonicotinoids were introduced. So, although there is no uh, no solid evidence, there are correlations. I can't say there's a causal link. But there's, there certainly are correlations, and again, that that's an additional reason to apply the precautionary principle and to ban the, 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 these dangerous compounds. Yes, absolutely. And the other thing is, um, you know, don't use them in your gardens if you plan to have children in the next ten years, really, because it, it stays in the ground that long, doesn't it? That, that's right. Children are playing, and also these chemicals are, are applied. Um, uh, against uh, insects on dogs, uh, and the uh, children are playing with with their pets and oh, yes, make, yes. Expo exposed to neonicotinoids via dogs or, or cats. That's true because um, there's a the product here called the Advantage flea flea controller thing contains neonicotinoids. That's, that's right. They, they, mm. they also use imidacloprid for that purpose, and you may expose children to. Um, to these insecticides uh, via free, free treatment of dogs and, uh, and cats. That's a very good point. Very good point, Hank, yeah. So, um, yes, uh, I mean, it would really be wise to, to ban imidacloprid, cathianidin, and thiocloprid, thio, thiomethoxam, like the Europeans have done for some applications. Because um, the risks we are taking are simply too great. Yeah, absolutely. I I totally agree with that. And have you read Dr. Liu's um, recent study from Harvard University? Yeah, Alex Liu is doing fantastic work, but he's he's obviously uh, getting a lot of criticism. He from is, yeah. Response to science, but he's he's really managed to prove it at a, at, a, at the level of of a colony, I mean, what, what, what we've shown uh, is really concerning individual bees, but Alex managed to to demonstrate similar effects uh, at a colony level. So he's basically providing um, an explanation for colony collapse disorder. 
But as, as I understand it, he wasn't able to publish his research in an American science journal to find a, a publisher in Europe that was willing to publish his data. Oh, so okay. that there, is, there is stiff opposition. And whenever yes. you, uh, you try and publish independent research implicating uh, neonics in, 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 uh, in, in B or insect decline, bound to get a lot of uh, opposition. Absolutely. And I, I, I see Bayer's response was the study was seriously flawed. Have you got any comment about that? Well, that, that, that's all they, and they, they may have a point in, in that the dose levels were higher than, um, than, um, than perhaps in, in, in practical terms was, was, uh, to be expected. Yeah. But the point is that Lou is demonstrating a connection between BD, BD Klein and, and the new, new nicotinoids. And if you take, um, Sanchez Bio's work and my work, Paco Santos Bayo is working at the University of uh, of Sydney in Australia, and his work was so important in in uh, for my discovery of that the Drucker Kupfer equation was also applied to to uh, to uh, invertebrates uh, for neonicotinoids. Uh, I mean, if you take Lou's data and my data uh, uh, and Santos Bayo's data. Then it is absolutely clear that that there is a tremendous risk for for honeybees. Um, so they don't put it into a context of what is known about the neonicotinoids. The, the, so the, the criticism is uh, and 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 if you realise that that um, Bayer is safeguarding its study and not publishing its own studies on on uh, on on. Uh, the effects of neonics on, 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 on bees. But whenever um, uh, an independent scientist comes up with, with, um, with, with a study on neonics, it's immediately subjected to a, a, a extreme scrutiny. Mm. It's their own data, they're sitting on their own data. You know? They're not making them public, and, uh, and that they should do uh, as well to make the data available to the scientific community. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, you know, so basically double out. standards really um, apply here. But I think Alex Liu, to to summarise, Alex Liu, uh, Alex Liu has done fantastic work and ought to be commended for his his uh, his contribution to uh, to the science of of neonicotinoids. Absolutely, and you know he, he's he's brave to stick his head, head up above the sand, isn't he? Really, that's um, right, that's yeah. right. And those people are uh, are the whistleblowers are, are are needed more more than anything, more than ever, uh, when it comes to neonicotinoid insecticides. There have to be scientists that stand up and and uh, and and blow the whistle because otherwise. We're, we're heading for a terrible environmental disaster. Yes, yes, indeed. I totally agree. And do you think um, other countries in Europe will follow suit and, and sort of ban their nicotinoids and like the Netherlands has? Well, I I, uh, I gave a presentation before the Austrian Parliament in 2012, and uh, I'm, I'm hopeful of Austria as a as an example in, in, in European agricultural policy, uh, a, 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 approximately 40% of Austrian agriculture uh, is organic, so it doesn't use um, pesticides. And that's a, exempt, that's a great example in, uh, in Europe, 40% of nearly half of agriculture without the use of pesticides. And that's the way we must go in future. Because uh, the application of pesticides since since uh, World War II uh, may have uh, improved uh, the efficiency of food production, but it's caused a tremendous loss of biodiversity. Mm. So we, we must uh, redirect agricultural research such that that we can only that we can only use uh, chemical insecticides or pesticides 
when there is no other option, you know, um, integrated pest management. But if we start seeding, coating seeds uh, against pests that may never occur, coating, coating seeds with insecticides, then we're on the wrong track. And um, we've been applying insecticides, herbicides, and, and, and fungicides, left, right, and center, uh, since, since the 1950s. And it's caused a tremendous loss of biodiversity. The songbirds are going, for example. Mm. Uh, the gray partridge is going. Uh, the pheasant is going. There's so many. The sage grouse in, in, in the, on the American plains is uh, is in the close to extinction. There are so many examples of cherished uh, species that we were going to to lose if we continue to use pesticides. Indeed, and especially the honeybees. And especially the honeybees, and uh, <laughs> the honeybees are so, are so important for pollination. Mm. It's the number one pollinator on the planet, and 30% of our food, our fruit and vegetables, depend on only honeybees. If, if we don't have honeybees, we'd be uh, reduced to eating wheat and rice, and, and uh, there'd be no, no strawberry ice cream uh, any longer, you know. No. Wimbledon will have to uh, <clears throat> go without strawberries and uh, and probably champagne as well. I think our diets would be very plain and boring, wouldn't they? <clears throat> it would be very boring indeed. Mm. So, what what do you think the solution is, Hank? What what would what would you like to see happening in the world? Well, what I would like to see is uh, the agricultural universities of the world focusing on pesticide free the developing procedures for pesticide-free agriculture. And I think we should uh, revise the uh, pesticide risk assessment such that uh, incidents like with the neonics can't happen again. And, uh, and we should ban the most dangerous uh, neonicotinoid insecticides. That would be the way to go, to, cause the way to go I think. Yeah, absolutely. I hope, I hope it will happen. Yeah, well, we we do too, and and you know, it's th from the work that you do, it's really helping um, the argument around the world, isn't it? So it's fantastic what you've been doing. Well, when, when Rachel Carson wrote a book, she 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 wrote, um, knowing what I do, there would be no future peace for me if I kept silent, mm. and that's very much what triggered me to 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 write this book. I've I've been um, uh, become a victim of of the chemical industry, I nearly lost all my clients, but I felt it was my 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 duty as an as a toxicologist to stand up and then to raise the alarms because Absolutely. there's very there are very serious uh, risks that are being underestimated, and we've got to do something about it. Absolutely, because I mean the thing is that the fight's today, but it's really the world's our great grandchildren, isn't it? Well, that, that's, I've got two grandchildren, and mm. uh, it's their world that we're destroying. Yeah. We should preserve this planet and, uh, and its natural beauty for generations to come. We've only, um, uh, we've only hired this planet from our grandchildren, haven't we? We have, exactly. And, uh, so, so it's our, our duty to, to, uh, to hand uh, a healthy planet to our grandchildren. Absolutely, and so for all you New Zealanders, there's an election in September, so vote, vote for the planet. Vote to Sue Gadsby's colleagues into yes. Parliament, make them a strong movement, and uh, preserve, uh, thereby preserve the great natural heritage of New Zealand. Indeed, and our, our our natural birds and our natural yeah plants. It's it is a unique place. So if it you've... is a fantastic place. Uh, it is a, I, my daughter travelled to New Zealand recently. Oh, and okay. She's enthusiastic about the country. Yeah, you've got you've got the beaches, the, the, the Pacific, um, the mountains. You've you've got the lakes. You've got everything in one one country. And for God's sake, preserve it. 
Yes, thank, that's, thanks, thanks, Hank. That's fantastic. Have, have you been here before or not yet? No, I haven't, and I probably won't, will never in my life because I, I, 25, four hours travel would be too much for me at my age. Yes. I'll be yeah. 64 this year. I'm overweight. I'm suffering from emphysema and uh, because I've smoked, been smoking most of my life. Yeah. So it's, it's not on the cards, but I, I, I treasure New Zealand and um, I, I hope the country will remain strong and, um, and prosperous and will with a, with a, um, remain as beautiful as, um, as it is at the moment. Yes, and indeed. I think that's a great, great place to stop there, Hank. So thank you so much for coming on tonight. Well, support. it's a great pleasure that you give me an opportunity to speak to your uh, your countrymen. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. No, that, thank you. And uh, good luck with the World Cup too. Thank you very much. And I <laughs> uh, wish you very much soon. Yes, thanks, Hank. Will you stay on the line? I'll just close the show. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening. This is uh, Kiwi Mana, and the show notes for this one is kiwimana.co.nz slash 52. So we'll see you next time.